find and supported it instead. One group that became more fervent than almost anyone was Emmeline Suffragette. She announced that all suffragette action would cease because... With that patriotism which has nerved women to endure endless torture, we ardently desire that our country shall be victorious. The war has made me feel how much there is of nobility in men. The suffragette newspaper denounced a minister at the Foreign Office because he had a German uncle. And Sylvia despaired as the rest of her family went round the country speaking at recruiting meetings for the army. And according to her... They handed white feathers to every young man they encountered wearing civilian dress. And they always assured their audience that God was on their side. Of course he was. God's always on your side in a war. There has never, as far as I know, been a war in which a general has got up and said... Last night, in this, our time of need, I prayed to God. Unfortunately, he seems he's backing the Turks on this one. One of a handful of individuals across Europe to announce their opposition to the war was Sylvia Pankhurst. She wrote that... As I saw this clamour to war, there was a cry within me. Stop all this breaking of bones, this mangling of men, this making of widows. So Emmeline wrote her a letter. I'm ashamed of where you stand on the war. I only wish Harry was still alive so he could have gone and fought. I wonder if she said, oh, I wish I was like Mrs Wickham over the road. Eight strapping young boys she had. Lost a lot at Passchendaele. Oh, I was jealous. But apart from the carnage, the war also caused food shortages, forcing up prices. So Sylvia turned her office into a cheap cafe for the most desperate on a site which is now a pub with possibly the finest pub sign in the whole of Britain. She even set up a toy factory to give people work. Women whose husbands had gone away to war would come to work in this little building in a sort of anarchist profit share collective. And from here, Sylvia set up marriages between local women and single soldiers so that the women could carry on getting an allowance. But the difference between Sylvia and the old suffragettes was shown when she got one of her old suffragette comrades in to help. A lad who'd been on suffragette demonstrations came in destitute looking for help and the suffragette told him, Well, why don't you enlist? It was in the women's dreadnought that Siegfried Sassoon first made an anti-war statement and at one point the paper was selling 40,000 copies a week. The women's dreadnought called for mutinies in the army at which point Sylvia was jailed for six months for sedition. In the summer of 1915, Sylvia received a letter from Keir Hardy which began worryingly, Dear Sylvia, in which he told her that he was so ill he didn't expect to last a week. A few days later, while speaking on a demonstration against conscription, she noticed a newspaper headline, Keir Hardy dead. Following this despair, she became ecstatic when news reached her that Lenin and the Bolsheviks had taken power in the Russian Revolution and captured the Tsar. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yes! Come on! Get At this point, she changed her paper's name to the Workers' Dreadnought. The government sent arms to the forces fighting against the Russian Revolution, but dockers in the east end of London refused to load them. The River Thames Joint Shop Stewards Movement organised this campaign, and Sylvia kept them continuously supplied with Lenin's appeal to the working masses, which was printed illegally. Communist Harry Pollitt said... My landlady in Poplar expressed surprise that my mattress seemed to vary in size from day to day. She little knew that inside our mattress we kept our copies of Lenin's Appeal. Sylvia was invited to attend a socialist conference in Stuttgart, but she didn't have a visa, so she had to slip out of the country in disguise and go to Italy. Then she travelled along goat paths to get into Switzerland, finally reaching Germany having crossed the Alps on foot. She travelled to Russia on a tiny Norwegian fishing boat as a stowaway without a passport across the Arctic Sea. When she got to Russia, she was hugely impressed with the revolution, but she had an argument with Lenin, insisting the British Communist Party should have nothing to do with elections to a parliament. Lenin wrote a book arguing against Sylvia Pankhurst's stance called Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder. That's cool, isn't it? To have Lenin going, oh trouble with you is you're too bloody left wing. Be like sitting in a pub with George Best and him going, oh, I'm going home, you're just being silly now mate. Lenin insisted that the communist parties of Europe should participate in elections and wherever possible they should join the Labour Party. 
Sylvia derided the idea of joining the Labour Party and of standing in elections at all, saying that the Communists should instead be encouraging power to pass to the local communities. So having spent her whole life campaigning for the vote, now she was saying there was no point in anybody voting. So instead of joining the newly formed Communist Party, Sylvia and a few supporters went off to form their own party. And over the next few years, the workers' dreadnought became increasingly hostile to the Russian Revolution. But it did run a series of lessons for Esperanto as a way of combating nationalism. Then the subtitle of the paper for international communism was dropped and replaced with new ones such as for clear thoughts and plain language and the happy are always good. She might as well have had... Workers dread not. Because I'm worth it. Ironically, as the Pankhursts were at war with themselves, the government was preparing to back down. Following the war, it seemed inconceivable that soldiers who'd fought the war should then be denied the vote. So a bill was proposed to extend the vote to all adult men. But then, as the men had gone off to fight, one and a half million women had taken their place in the factories. So it also seemed ridiculous to deny them the vote, as they had clearly taken on the traditional men's roles. So the vote was granted to all women over the age of 30. And one of the first women to stand for election to Parliament was Emmeline Pankhurst for the Women's Party, campaigning for policies such as women wearing less lipstick. Christabel went even more peculiar. She became an Adventist and predicted that Europe was about to enter an age of dictators and earthquakes which would end with the Second Coming. Why do people feel the need to join these sorts of religions? Are they in church listening to stories about how God made woman out of a rib and parted the sea and turned Lot's wife into a pillar of salt while they sit there thinking, trouble with this religion, it's not mad enough for me. Emily became the parliamentary candidate for Whitechapel, backed by the Conservatives, while several of the most prominent suffragettes went on to work for the British Union of Fascists. Which must have been quite handy, they could have given the SS tips on breaking windows. In contrast, Sylvia fell in love with an exiled Italian anarchist who worked on the workers' dreadnoughts called Silvio Correo. This has to be one of the biggest family rifts of all time. Sylvia and Silvio moved to a house on this site that they called Red Cottage in the suburban area of Woodford in Essex. What a fantastic thing to do for no other reason than to annoy everybody on the neighbourhood watch scheme. I love the idea of suburban anarchists. 